Hello, my name is Angus. I'm a researcher at Xanadu in Toronto. Uh, and today I want to tell you about some improved lower bounds for learning quantum states with single copy measurements. And this is joint work with Ashwin Nayak that was completed while I was at the University of Waterloo and the Institute for Quantum Computing. Now, let me begin with a very general scenario that's going to help motivate the problem that we're interested in. Suppose that we have a learner uh, named Alice. Alternatively, you can consider her an experimentalist uh, and that she's given access to n identical copies of some unknown quantum state rho. We assume that Alice has the ability to perform some measurement on these registers and that she's interested in inferring some properties of the unknown state. Um, for example, she might be interested in the expectation values of some set of observables this is a question that um, shadow tomography tries to answer, for example. Alternatively, maybe she's interested in determining whether uh, a quantum device that she has, like a quantum computer, is functioning as expected. And in this case, what she might want to do is ask whether rho is equal to some fixed state sigma. And, uh, finally, uh, a question that encompasses any question that Alice might want to ask about this unknown state is just what is the state? Um, this very fundamental question is the one that quantum state tomography tries to answer. Uh, now, let me be a little bit more precise about what I mean by quantum state tomography. Um, here, we suppose that we're given some input, which is a measurement outcome uh, from some measurement performed on n identical copies of an unknown d dimensional quantum state. And our task is to output an estimate rho hat that's epsilon accurate in trace distance with high probability. And ideally, we'd like to do this using as few copies of the state as possible. In the most general case, you're allowed to perform a joint measurement on all the registers simultaneously, and then use that outcome to infer what the state is. And in this case, the, the number of copies uh, that are necessary and sufficient to perform this task um, it was derived due to breakthrough works by O'Donnell and Wright, as well as Ha, Hero, G, Wu, and Yu. And they show that for, for information theoretic reasons, um, you can't do better than d squared, and that it suffices to take uh, a number of copies that grows like d squared. However, in the more realistic case, where measurements have to be performed on individual copies of the state, uh, things are much less well established. And this is known as the, the set of single copy strategies. And so here, um, you can make a further distinction between uh, the set of all strategies that are uh, non-adaptive and those that are adaptive. And here, what we mean is in the non-adaptive case, the, the measurements that you're performing have to be chosen ahead of time. Whereas in the adaptive case, you're allowed to choose your measurement um, based on the, the previous outcomes that were obtain, obtained. And this is the kind of quantum tomography that we're going to be interested in. So I think it's going to help to explain this kind of quantum tomography graphically and then define some things that we're interested in along the way. Uh, suppose that our experimentalist picks a, a measurement from a set of measurement settings and then performs that measurement on the first copy of the unknown state, obtaining measurement outcome y sub one. Um, then what they can do in the adaptive case, for example, is to pick a different measurement from um, a set of possible measurement settings and then apply that measurement to the next copy of the state and so on. And now uh, in general, in the most general case, this set of all measurement settings is just this, the set of all possible um, POVMs that you could, you could apply. But uh, more realistically, it's just a finite set of different measurements. And here, so that the notation it is not too confusing. Let me elaborate a little bit. So here, uh, an individual element in this set corresponds to its own POVM. Uh, that is a set of measurement operators that induces a distribution over L primes. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Uh, let me tell you about what was known about tomography in this measurement model. So firstly, we have some upper bounds. Uh, the first one is, is essentially folklore. Uh, you can find it in Nielsen and Chang, for example, which is that it suffices to take d to the four copies of the state um, using a measurement strategy that's basically based on 
estimating the coefficients of the unknown state and the basis of Pauli operators. And these measurements are just binary measurements. Uh, it was also known uh, due to work by Quang, Rahut, and Terstiesch um, that it suffices to take the number of copies that grows like d cubed uh, using rank one POVNs. And here you can imagine that what you're doing is you're measuring in a random basis, uh, or rather a basis that's sufficiently random. And in particular, you you require that the, the random basis is generated by unitary operators that comprise a two design. And to make this more concrete, you can imagine that U is like a random Clifford circuit. And in fact, um, they show that an improved bound uh, holds if you know an upper bound on the rank of the state, but I'm going to ignore that for the purposes of this talk. So what's known for lower bounds um, for each of these rows, I'm going to uh, display a cartoon of the, the strategy that I'm considering. So in the first case, it was shown by uh, Flamia, Gross, Liu, and Isert in 2012 that you need at least D to the four copies if your measurement strategy is basically just two outcome Pauli measurements, um, even if you can adapt on uh, prior outcomes. Then, um, in the work due to Ha and others that showed the upper bound on entangled tomography, they also showed a lower bound in the case where you have to make your measurements non-adaptively. And this brings us to our results. So firstly, we show that using, um, using non-adaptive measurements that are limited to a constant number of outcomes, you require at least D to the four copies of the state. And in particular, this implies that the, the, the folklore Pauli tomography algorithm from the previous slide is optimal in, in a certain sense. Um, we next show uh, a lower bound that generalizes the results due to Flamia and others that holds um, for any measurement strategy that has a number of settings that grows polynomial in the dimension of the state, uh, so long as those measurements have a constant number of outcomes. And so that's what's depicted over here. And uh, finally, this brings us to our main result, which is a tight lower bound on single copy quantum tomography that's robust to adaptivity, so long as um, you're limited to a number of measurement settings that doesn't grow exponentially in the dimension. And so that's depicted on the right-hand side. And now why might this bound be interesting? Well, let me tell you, first of all, that these are the, the two lower bounds that I'm going to be focusing on mainly in this talk. Uh, let me explain why that last bound is interesting in particular. Um, well, it, it implies that adaptivity makes no difference without a number of distinct measurement settings that grows like doubly exponential in the number of qubits that comprise your system. So one might imagine that your strategy for tomography is to implement a measurement using some quantum circuit um, with a depth that grows polynomially in the number of qubits. Um, and then, you know, using the, the measurement outcomes that you obtain, pick a different circuit in the next iteration, and so on. And what our lower bound says is that you can't do better than uh, d cubed copies of the state using uh, all such strat any such strategy. And in particular, this means that the random Clifford uh, strategy um, is optimal amongst all strategies that are implementable using uh, depth polynomial and Q circuits, uh, even if you allow them to be adaptive. Okay, so let me tell you about how we get this lower bound. Suppose that we have a family of quantum states, which I've denoted by F, and uh, consider a finite subset of that family of quantum states, H, which is two epsilons separated in trace distance. We call such a finite subset uh, a packing of F then the first thing to notice is that quantum state discrimination of the packing reduces to quantum tomography. <clears throat> and so the way to see this is looking at this red dot over here. Um, if you can perform tomography to sufficient accuracy, 
then you can identify which state was prepared from the set of alternatives. Uh, and so what this means is that if you pick uh, a state uniformly at random, up there, or in the packing, if you pick a state in the packing uniformly at random, uh, then uh, you prepare n copies of the state course of that state, then the learner, Alice, can uh, decode what that state was um, using the measurement outcomes. And this implies by Fano's inequality that the mutual information between the random variable representing the choice of state and the outcomes obtained has to be at least uh, log of the cardinality of the packing. Uh, roughly speaking, what this is saying is that the amount of sh the shared information between the outcomes and the choice of state has to be at least a constant fraction of the information contained in the random choice of state. And so um, a general method for lower bounds, which is colloquially known as Fano's method in, in the statistical learning literature, is to do the following. It's to choose a family of states and a packing of that family uh, so that the following set of bounds holds. And uh, in particular, you want it to be large enough that this lower bound holds by Fano's inequality and yet lead to um, mutual information, which is upper bounded by some small constant delta times the number of copies of the state. And so this is what we're going to show in the next few slides. And let me focus on the lower bound first. So how do we construct a large packing that leads to this lower bound? Well, we're going to consider states of the following form. Here, um, rho sub u is a state that's um, generated by some choice of unitary operator u. And pi is a, an orthogonal projection operator uh, of rank d over 2. So this is some state. And uh, what you do is you in interpolate between that state and the completely mixed state according to this parameter epsilon. And the family of states we're going to consider is the set of all such states. And a good lemma due to Ha and others, uh, that's essentially a, a simple consequence of a, a lemma known as concentration of projector overlaps derived in 2004 by Haydn, Lung, and Winter is the following. Um, it, what it says basically is that the probability of picking um, uh, a state uniformly at random from this family um, that's, that <clears throat> is epsilon close in trace distance to some fixed state in that family is exponentially small in d squared. And so what this allows you to do is perform a probabilistic existence argument in, in the following manner. What you do is you consider the set of all unitary operators. And what this lemma tells you is that there's a very small set of unitary operators that leads to a packing collision, essentially. And so you just pick states that are outside of that small uh, bad subset. And this implies that there exists a large packing with cardinality at least exponential in d squared, and hence we get our lower bound on the mutual information. Uh, now, um, for the upper bound, this brings us back to our choice of, of states. Why did we choose it to be of this form? Well, I hope it's clear that the probabilities of the different outcomes from performing a measurement on this state are going to look like random noise if your state is very close to being completely mixed. And so one might guess that the, the measurements are not going to be very informative. And indeed, let's consider um, the setup that we have where you're preparing n copies of the random state according to the, the random choice uh, z. You can consider the mutual information between the random variables. Uh, it holds due to properties of the Haar measure that the, this mutual information quantity is upper bounded by a different mutual information quantity which essentially corresponds to replacing the ensemble that we were previously considering with an ensemble that's uniformly random over, um, over the family. And uh, by uniformly random, I mean it's, it's har random with respect to the choice of the unitary operator. And um, you, know, you might be concerned that, well, this random variable is not discrete. Does this make sense? Uh, rest assured that the mutual information is, is well-defined for arbitrary random variables, so you just have to be a little bit careful, but uh, 
um, this is fine. And now what we can do is make use of the fact that we know because the measurements are non-adaptive that the measurement outcomes are conditionally independent of each other uh, to conclude that this upper bound holds, which is known as subadditivity of mutual information. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on one of these little circuits here. And those, that little circuit right here corresponds to an individual mutual information term. And we're going to try and compute that mutual information term using harm integration. So let's put it in the top right and remove some subscripts for clarity. Let's uh, define the, for a fixed choice of unitary, V, what the probability distribution is over the outcomes. Well, that's just Warren's rule. And let's also use shorthand for the marginal distribution over all possible outcomes, uh, marginalizing over the, the choice of unitary operator. And uh, it can be shown that a very simple expression holds in this case. We just compute the Haar integral. Um, and it's just the trace of the measurement operator corresponding to that outcome divided by the dimension. Uh, we're going to make use of a proposition that says that, this, that the mutual information between two random variables is essentially upper bounded by the chi-squared divergence of, of the distributions that I just defined. And the chi-squared divergence is defined for you over here. And what does this allow us to do? Well, then it suffices to compute this Haar integral and we can do this. This is essentially what's done in the paper by Ha and others, except they use uh, rank one POVMs and it's, it differs slightly in some places, um, but you can compute this Haar integral and it's essentially equal to this expression here. And then you can use uh, two different upper bounds on the trace of the measurement operator squared to conclude two different upper bounds on, on this quantity. The first upper bound is what leads to the lower bound of d cubed in the non-adaptive case due to Ha and others. Uh, and on the other hand, the second lower bound over here is completely useless unless the, the number of outcomes that you can resolve is not too large. So in particular, if this sum is over a constant number of terms, then this is actually a better upper bound asymptotically. And so let me just summarize the, these non-adaptive lower bounds, the, the argument for the non-adaptive lower bounds. Um, we have our first inequality due to Fano's inequality. Somewhere along the line, we make use of the conditional independence of the random variables. And then we use our chi-squared divergence upper bound to come up with um, our results. And let's focus on the conditional independence of the random variables for a second because uh, this is the step that breaks down when you consider adaptive measurements. So uh, let's look at that more closely. This is the subadditivity property mutual information that holds in the non-adaptive case. Unfortunately, it doesn't hold in the case where the measurements can adapt. And so we need something else. And um, you might know that there's a chain rule for mutual information, which basically says that this equality holds. And what we can do is try to use this um, fact. And to this end, let's upper bound each of these individual terms by some uh, expected chi-squared divergence. And uh, the following idea is, is the crux of our result, which is, can we pick a set of states, uh, a very difficult ensemble for quick quantum state discrimination, such that the chi-squared divergence terms are all very small? And it turns out that we can. So let me show you how this can be done. Uh, recall this, this cartoon from a previous slide, uh, which allowed us to construct our packing in the non-adaptive case. For the adaptive case with a finite number of measurement settings, what we're gonna claim is that there's also a very small subset of these unitary operators that lead to informative measurements. And so our strategy is going to um, construct our difficult ensemble using quantum states that lie outside both of these subsets and then proceed using a probabilistic existence argument to, to argue that this is possible. And uh, more specifically, we use this lemma, um, a concentration of the chi-squared divergence, or I should say we derive this, but what it says is that for a fixed measurement M, 
we let P sub U be the distribution over outcomes from measuring the state and W to be the shorthand for the, the marginal distribution, then the following holds the, the probability of selecting a unitary operator such that the chi-square divergence term is large is exponentially small in D. And roughly speaking, you can think of this event as corresponding to um, the probability uh, as corresponding to picking a unitary operator uh, that leads to informative measurement statistics on that measurement. And so what this leads to ultimately is an upper bound on the mutual information uh, on, on each of the mutual information terms that's like this expression over here. And that leads to our main theorem, which is that roughly speaking, D cubed measurements are required so long as there aren't too many measurement settings. And now let me just conclude with some uh, open problems. Firstly, is it possible to get unconditional non-trivial non bounds for adaptive tomography? This is uh, a question that was posed in, in the thesis of John Wright, for example. Um, alternatively, one might ask whether you can get rank dependent bounds using finite measurement settings. Uh, another interesting direction is whether uh, you can perform testing using single copy measurements. Sorry, not whether you can perform, but whether you can derive lower bounds on testing using single copy measurements under the assumption of finite measurement settings. And finally, um, I'm wondering whether we can use our techniques to, to get like circuit lower bounds, so to speak, for, for optimal entangled quantum tomography. And this question is related to a conjecture by Ha in, in that paper by Ha and others um, that optimal entangled tomography can be implemented using um, circuits that uh, whose depth grows polynomial in D essentially. And with that, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you very much for listening.